In this video, we're going to talk about reliability in statistics and research. Reliability is a simple concept. It's essentially your consistency of measurement. And this is important because we need to be taking consistent measurements and accurate measurements of the world, or else as we progress on to inferential statistics, we're going to end up making inaccurate conclusions about populations, inaccurate conclusions about the world. So today, I'm going to talk to you about four different types of reliability, and you're going to see this idea of consistency of measurement sort of underlying all of them, although they will take slightly different forms. So first, we're going to talk about test-retest reliability. Next, we'll talk about parallel forms reliability. Then, inter-rater reliability. And finally, internal consistency, a little bit of a different one. So let's start with test-retest reliability. Test-retest reliability, as the name suggests, is used when you want to determine whether a test or a scale or some psychological measurement tool or whatever is reliable over time. And the idea is that you're going to test people and then you're going to retest them and you're going to see if scores align. Are your scores consistent over time? And this is typically measured as a simple correlation, which you already know how to calculate from previous videos. So it's a correlation between how people score at time one when they first take the test and those same participants, how they score at time two when they take the test again. So let me illustrate with an example. Let's say I want to develop a new IQ test. Well, if my IQ test is actually doing a good job of measuring people's IQ, we would expect people to score similarly the first time they take the test and the second time they take the test. So let's look at some sample data here. So let's say these are scores at time one and these are scores at time two of the same participants. So if you take a quick scan here, you'll see we're doing pretty well. Let's say it's like a month later when they take the test again. So here, participant one starts out with an IQ of 100, right at average, and they end up with an IQ of 101 very similar. And across all of these participants, you're going to see we're typically only one or two points off. You know, here's a little bit of a bigger difference. Maybe just didn't have his coffee this morning or whatever, right? Uh, but overall, we would say that this has good test-retest reliability. The scores tend to cluster together very closely. And if you actually did the correlation between these two variables, you would get an extremely strong correlation, 0.99, almost a perfect relationship between how people do in the beginning to how people do at the end. Now here's an example of not so great test-retest reliability. You're going to see, for example, look at participant number three. The first time they took the IQ test, they scored 98, slightly below average. The second time, though, a month later, they scored a 115, above average. This is actually one standard deviation above the mean. And this is an example of scores varying wildly from time one to time two. And we wouldn't expect this to happen, right? There's no reason to believe that within a month, someone would increase their intelligence by this much. It's simply not feasible. A better alternative explanation is that my IQ test is simply not a good IQ test. And by the way, if you did the correlation between these two variables, it would look pretty pathetic. Negative 0.08, very poor test-retest reliability. So next, let's talk about parallel forms reliability. Parallel forms reliability is very similar, but it's sort of a more specific, more unique case of test-retest reliability. Parallel forms reliability is used when you want to examine the equivalence or similarity between two forms of the same test. So for example, if you're a teacher and you have a form A and a form B on the exam, you might want to know if those forms are equally difficult, if they're doing a good job of, you know, assessing the same concepts, things like that. Are they similar to one another? And you're going to measure parallel forms reliability in a similar sort of way as we did with test-retest reliability. You're going to give people form A in the beginning, and maybe a week later or a month later, at time two, you'll give them form B. So the only difference here, we're still measuring test and retest, but the difference is we have two different forms. It's not a copy and paste of the same test twice, which is what we have with test-retest reliability. So for parallel forms reliability, you're also going to measure it the same way as with test-retest reliability. It's just going to be a simple correlation between scores for the same individuals on form A and form B at these two different time points. And again, we're going to hope for a strong positive correlation. We're going to hope that scores tend to be similar on form A as on form B. Next, we have inter-rater reliability. This one is used for a slightly different situation, but it's still an idea of consistency underlying it. 
Interrater reliability is used when you want to know how much two different raters or experimenters or observers agree on their judgments of an outcome of interest. So there are many cases in which you might be interested in interrater reliability, but it's definitely something that's most prevalent in observational research. So typically if you're observing, say, a child, your developmental psychologist maybe, you're not just going to observe that child alone, right? You're going to use multiple observers, multiple experimenters, because people can miss things. You may not notice something, right? So it's better to have multiple observers to really make sure you're getting a true and accurate representation of what happened. And this is what interrater reliability is all about. It's about are those different experimenters consistent with one another in terms of what they're seeing? Do they tend to agree with one another? So there is sort of a formula for interrater reliability, and here it is. It's almost not necessary, though, because it's just a simple percentage of agreement. That's it. It's a proportion or a percentage of the number of times that the two experimenters or more are agreeing with one another. So it's interrater reliability equaling the number of times the experimenters agreed with one another divided by the number of times they could have possibly agreed if they were perfect. So this is sort of the number of trials. And again, this is kind of a percentage. So let's take an example. Let's say I'm interested in happiness, right? Uh, measuring happiness among children. Maybe I'm interested in gender differences and how happy boys and girls are, and this is sort of my starting point. So I'm gonna have two experimenters observe how often a child smiles. This is how I'm gonna operationalize happiness, how I'm gonna sort of define it and make it observable. So how often does this child smile across 10 one-minute time intervals? So let's say I do this study, I collect this data, here's my data for experimenter 1, and here it is for experimenter 2. All 10 trials, and the number of smiles each experimenter saw. So you'll notice that in general they tend to agree pretty well. On trial 1, experimenter 1 saw 2 smiles, as did experimenter 2, and so on. But you'll notice that two of these are disagreements. On trial 4, for example, experimenter 1 saw 4 smiles, whereas experimenter 2 only saw 3. And we see disagreement on trial 7 as well. So in this case, we have 8 agreements and 2 disagreements. So our interrater reliability is simply 8 over 10, because that's the number of trials. That's the number of possible times they could have agreed if they were perfect. So in this case, we're going to have 8 over 10, or 80%, 0.8 if you'd like to think of this as a proportion, and this is our interrater reliability. So finally, we have internal consistency. Internal consistency is a pretty simple idea. It is kind of a pain to calculate, unlike some of these others, which are just simple correlations or, uh, you know, just a percentage, basically. Internal consistency has its own formula, which we'll talk about in the next video. It has its own sort of process, uh, and it is quite laborious to actually compute, but totally manageable if you follow some steps that I'm going to go over again in the next video. But for now, let's just think conceptually about what internal consistency really is. Okay, so many times in psychological research, you're going to need to measure something that hasn't been measured very often, if at all, in the past. And oftentimes, the best way to kind of go about this problem is to develop a scale. You'll give participants a series of items and you'll ask them to rate their agreement to those items, those statements for example, on a 1 to 9 scale. 1 perhaps being strongly disagree and 9 being strongly agree, a pretty standard sort of scale. Now if you're going to develop your own scale and you want to publish those results, for example, you're going to need to prove to experts in the field, other professors and graduate students and so on, that your scale is reliable and also, as we'll talk about in a future video, that your scale is valid. So internal consistency is a way of measuring the reliability of a scale. It's used when you want to know whether items on a scale or a test or whatever are consistent with each other, showing that they measure one and only one thing. So here's an example of an anxiety scale that I developed for the purposes of this video. Let's take a look at each of these items and kind of make a guess about what the internal consistency is going to look like. So item one is, I often have worrying thoughts. Item two, I have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. Item three, I often feel nervous. Item four, I no longer take pleasure in things I used to enjoy. Item five, my heart often beats fast as fear enters in. And item six, I often feel sluggish and tired. So do you notice any potential problems with this anxiety scale? 
Well, you might have noticed that items 1, 3, and 5 measure anxiety, whereas items 2, 4, and 6 are actually doing a better job of getting at depression. I have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. I no longer take pleasure in things I used to enjoy. This is what we call anhedonia, and I often feel sluggish and tired. These are all symptoms of depression. So in this case, you can imagine if a person with anxiety takes this test, takes this scale, they're going to respond one way to items 1, 3, and 5, but if they don't have depression, they're going to respond very differently to items 2, 4, and 6. So all six items will not really do a great job of working together, and the result here is going to be poor internal consistency. So just in general, we want reliability scores to be positive. We don't want negative scores. Remember, a lot of these are correlations. Uh, for example, we want strong positive correlations, and we want those values to be as large as possible, typically between 0 and 1, although you can have values outside that range, but we want values close to 1. You're going to see this when we calculate internal consistency as well, just as one example. An internal consistency of 0.95 is excellent. An internal consistency of 0.1 or 0.3 is not so good. And keep in mind why we care about all of this. It's because we want to be able to make accurate predictions about populations, accurate predictions about the world. We want to make good estimations. And in order to estimate things well, to make good guesses about populations, we need to be reliable. And again, as we'll see in the future, we need to be valid in how we measure things. Increasing reliability decreases error and more closely aligns our estimates with the truth.